Good morning. This is day three. Welcome to the Virtual Empowerment Weekend. Hopefully you've been enjoying the last couple of days and unfortunately this is the final day. My name is Lois Margolin and I will be your facilitator. In case you don't know it, you will be muted throughout this entire presentation until Samantha asks us to unmute you or the presentation is over. Your video is on. We encourage you to leave your video on so Samantha can feel the love. At the end of the session, I will paste an evaluation form and we ask you to please fill that out so that Samantha can get some feedback. Now to hear about our amazing speaker. Samantha, currently overcoming adversity is more relevant than ever. Adopt fluid leadership strategies and tactics to ride life's waves and stay afloat even during the most turbulent storms. Please put your hands together and help me welcome Samantha Nganza. Did I butcher that name? I'm sorry, Sam. You did, and that's okay. It's in Guanzo. It's a learning experience. We're all here to learn together. Welcome, everybody, to this very interactive and I need to set my camera a little bit so you can see me better. This worked out when I tested it, but Murphy's Law always seems to show up right when things are at its peak. All right, happy Sunday fun day. We're gonna talk about fluid leadership today. Has anyone ever heard of that? If you have, please put us in the chat what you've heard. Give a little bit of information about leaders that you know and inspire you. If you have any examples, we'd love to see what they are, and then we'll have discussions about that as we go further. We're going to be focusing on four key concepts of fluid leadership that I think are the most important to adopt and overcome any type of struggle that you might face, whether it is in your personal life, your professional life, or as we've all seen with COVID-19 coming. <laughs> yes, happy leaders are the best leaders coming to grips with a change or a disruption, any type of innovation that can drastically change our lives and basically recreate the normal that we once knew. All right, moving right along. Innovation is inevitable. This is a recent Accenture report that found out that 93% of chief strategy officers who basically run the entire business decided that innovation was going to at some point impact their corporations. This can be any type of change, whether it is COVID-19 or autonomous vehicles. Innovation generally disrupts the normal society as we know it and has to force us to change and adapt in new ways. However, the study also found out that only 20% of those same chief strategy officers felt that they were ready for any type of disruption to enter their world. This is very crucial as Darren LaCroix told us yesterday, preparation prevents any type of failure in the future. Thus, if we don't prepare ourselves, we can't possibly hope to be the leaders that we need to be to navigate the turbulent waters and help our team succeed and thrive in spite of everything that's happening to us. All right, first poll question. Let's see, do you believe that leadership styles are fixed or that they're changing? Think of some leaders that you know, maybe Barack Obama or John F. Kennedy, if you're a politician fanatic, they were known for certain types of leadership styles. John F. Kennedy especially was a charismatic leader. Do you believe that these are fixed qualities or do you think that we as leaders can change what type of style we employ in our leadership journey? I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to think about that and decide on your answer choice. It's a simple yes or no question. All right, Lois, let me know whenever we've got a majority vote in so that we can move on to the second question. Oh, great, we've got 
Patty yeah. Stevenson saying, I believe they should not be fixed, but in most cases are. This is very true, Patty. I agree with you. A lot of leaders stay in the mindset that whatever style they feel most comfortable with is the style that they should continue using in every situation. So I okay, agree. Sam, I think change. our poll is done. All right. Perfect. And we've got a second poll really quickly. The personality. I like that. Paul Finkelstein. Here's some examples of leaders to help generate more thought ideas. A lot of these leaders have been world renowned for different qualities, such as Oprah Winfrey's amazing ability to connect with people, Tom Brady's mm -hmm. ability to inspire others, as well as Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg being able to revolutionize the way that we interact with each other. These are just a few examples. Though what I wanna talk about today is fluid leadership, which one individual who's a thought leader, David Siegel says, this style of leadership mimics nature and provides resilience. Rather than inspiring people to do their best, create and maintain a culture of empowering people to do their best. That's a huge mind shift from the typical leadership of inspiring and motivating others to get on board of what we want them to do. Instead, we should create an empowered environment. This is something in Toastmasters that we consistently reinforce. Our club mission statement is to provide a positive and supportive learning environment that empowers our members to develop communication and leadership skills, resulting in greater confidence and personal growth. This is in our mission statement, and we as Toastmasters need to be leading the way in embodying this value. We're also gonna get into a little bit of secrets. There's a hidden secret of leadership that few people know about. If you have an idea of what it could be, please share this in the chat and we will touch on this insight a little bit further as we wrap up the presentation. All right, now for the second poll. I wanna know about your leadership styles. We've heard that they're not fixed, right? I, I don't know if I saw the results, but we can always go to that later. <laughs> Did you this find it? No, ma'am. If you could direct me, that would be fantastic. Okay, um, oh. there you go, you found it. Yes, thank you, I just got the notification here. It looks like 88.9% of the participants think that no, they're not fixed, but we do have an 11.1% that thinks that they are fixed. Now we're gonna discuss, since the majority agrees they aren't fixed, how many leadership styles do you actively employ in your life? Is it just one? two, three, four or more? Do you actively use five at a time? Are you a superstar? We're already getting quite a few poll results in here. I see the majority right now has two active leadership styles. And we've got a very small percentage that uses four or more. We're gonna move right along. You can keep thinking about that. It takes a while to really delve into your own leadership strategies. I created this cute little acronym to help remember fluid leadership in my perspective, as well as a lot of academic research on it. Fluid leadership can be described in the acronym FLOW. Focus on your intent, leverage your assets, optimistic oneness, and wisdom wins. We're gonna delve into each of these topics a little further, and I'm gonna have examples as well as strategies that you can use to help bring out these different aspects of fluid leadership in your own journey. First, let's focus on intent. Time is our most valuable resource. Everybody here is giving up an entire hour of their time to better themselves 
and as a result, better everyone around them. If we focus on our intent, then we are working on valuing what matters. We're not caught up in things that are irrelevant or time wasters. Instead, we're really focused on our intention and in bringing out whatever is most benefit of people in each situation, whether this is our positivity or our curiosity. There's always so much in every individual situation. This is why it's hard to cover it all in one hour and reflect to everything. Although the three main things that every single individual needs is appreciation, affection, and acknowledgement. I believe that we as leaders have an opportunity to acknowledge when others are stepping up to the challenge and rising above and surpassing our goals that we have for them. It's really important for us as leaders to reflect on ourselves. Every relationship, in my opinion, as well as a lot of philosophical ideas, are that we're all reflections of each other. We're mirrors. If you think about water, when you look down into a puddle on a clear day, it reflects back yourself looking at it. If we see that someone is upset or angry, it may have nothing to do with us, or it may be the way that we're interacting with them. Maybe we're upset and angry and they're just reflecting back our own approach to the situation. This leads me to my first story. One of my mentors who's actually on this <laughs> video conference right now is an incredible Toastmaster. He's a distinguished Toastmaster, actually encouraged me to join Toastmasters originally. I was a college student. I actually have only been a Toastmaster for a little over two years now. I was actually a perpetual guest at the FAU Toastmasters Club for four entire years. I kept coming back to the meetings because they were really fun, lively. They distracted me from my pre-med course schedule, which was extremely <laughs> tumultuous to be lighthearted about it. It really kept me motivated as I found a community and a family in this Toastmasters club. He asked me one day, why haven't you joined Toastmasters? You could be giving speeches, developing yourself as a leader. You really need to join to get the full benefit out of it. You can't just be a guest. I told him, I'm sorry, Gino. I just don't really have the money to join right now. It's tough. I'm barely paying my bills and affording food. He very generously offered to sponsor my membership for the first six months on the contingency basis that I would complete the first five speeches of the CC manual. For everyone who's newer to Toastmasters, Competent Communicator was a total of 10 speeches that got you through the first part of Toastmasters. I told him that I was so thankful and appreciative of that offer, I would double his expectations and get through the whole 10 speeches in six months. Not only did I accomplish this goal, but I inspired him and empowered him so much through that trust and credibility of my actions that he inspired the next six months. I encourage and implore everyone who's watching this today, if you have extra funds available, I know that I'm personally going to do this, Think of someone who can benefit from Toastmasters and choose to sponsor their membership. It's really great to let them know the intent that you have and have expectations of how much effort they should put in in order to make that sponsorship worth it for both parties. However, as Steve Forbes, who's on the right, told me once, if you ever feel like you've made it, you're ready to be shown the door which is why every single one of us as leaders needs to be continual learners, constantly strive to grow, learn new things, because we're never done learning. Think about the spectrum here. Where do you fall and resonate with the most? Do you find yourself judging people a lot, or are you focused on appreciating them? 
to get to the highest level of relationships and build that trust that we need to have for effective relationships, we need to go further than understanding, appreciating, and respecting others. We need to actually value them as individuals for their individual strengths, their weaknesses. We need to value them just as humans to have that understanding that we all have something to give and something to learn. It's really important to focus on the value that people bring instead of looking at their mistakes or their mishaps because every single one of us has weaknesses. And if you think about it, if someone doesn't value you when you fall apart, how much did they really value you to start with? Everyone here loves tacos, right? If a taco falls apart, you still want to eat it. There's no reason to stop valuing a taco just because it all came apart on your plate. Thus, we shouldn't feel bad if we fall apart at times because life does get to us. Next, leverage your assets. We all have individual strengths, which we can see as assets, whether that's your ability to communicate well with others, to be transparent, to be vulnerable. You can leverage silence in certain situations if you need more time to think. Leverage your self-discipline, your ability to be open and love others. I'm leveraging the asset of my iPad, which likes to fall sometimes. <laughs> Max out all of the advantages that you have in your life, whether that is your advantage to lead others and empower them with your words, or if you're able to show people how much you appreciate them and really have a gift of words and helping other people feel like they're valuable. If you don't have that asset, look for the asset within your team members. This is the original network of teams on the far left, how people used to see teamwork. And that is a hierarchical structure where the top leaders basically disseminate information down to the middle managers who bring it down to the entry level workers. However, this concept of leadership and teamwork is very outdated. If you look over to the bottom complex of networks, that's how things are right now and how they work together. We're all just nodes in this giant network where we have the ability to exercise and create new things. You need to max out your capacity to imagine and recreate what we have because everything is really just a template. We can work from where we are. We're never starting from scratch. We have so much wisdom and knowledge that we've learned throughout the years. If you have to reinvent yourself, know that you're already starting from a platform to be launched. Whenever life pulls us back, it's basically like an arrow where we're gonna be shooting forward that much that we've been pulled back. Thus, never let life get you down when you get hit with struggles. Know that you have assets to leverage. I encourage everyone who's listening, write down your top 10 assets. If you find that there's assets you'd like to have, find other leaders that you can learn those from, whether that's on YouTube, watching motivational videos, or connecting with other leaders here at the Toastmasters Conference. There are so many resources for us to glean knowledge from, it's really important for us to take advantage of those and max out all advantages that we have. Next, I wanna go over a quick little MBA tip. You're getting <laughs> operations management in a nutshell. This equation here helps managers understand how to keep people satisfied. We all have perception, which our perception is our reality. We need to know that people's expectations will influence their satisfaction and well being overall. If we can manage those expectations, then we can help shift their perception to being something more positive. This 
comes up in business school all the time because if you tell an individual that it'll just be a minute and it turns into 15 minutes or half an hour, how does that make you feel? If you're waiting in line at a restaurant and the hostess tells you, oh, your table will be ready in five minutes, 20 minutes later, you still haven't heard anything back. Are you feeling very satisfied? I know me personally, I'd be a little concerned going up and asking questions because that satisfaction has been reduced. As soon as that perception is not consistent with the expectations that were communicated, we instantly become less satisfied. That's why as leaders, we have to focus on being transparent with everything that's relevant to the people that we're serving. If they don't know what to expect, we can almost guarantee dissatisfaction. Go beyond any expectations and you will always have ridiculously happy customers, whether that's in business or in your Toastmasters club, or even in relationships. It's really key to have that trust and credibility by managing expectations and influencing the perception. I will get to the questions. I see them rolling in. We're gonna just roll right through the rest of this presentation and flow into the conclusion, then we'll get to all the questions, but keep them coming. Next, we're gonna talk about optimistic oneness. This is really about going beyond our mind and our intellect and our ego, which is really the biggest thing that stands in our way. There's a really great quote that I love and that says, oneness is nothing but holds the potential for everything. If we're able to see each other in eyes of unity and togetherness and being on the same team, we're able to accomplish loads more than we could ever imagine. This is all about the life-giving spirit that connects each and every one of us. We can either speak words that enhance people's lives or bring them down. I have a funny story that happened the other day. I was pet sitting for one of my neighbors who's out of town and she has a huge saltwater fish tank. It's really gorgeous, but she has this one fish that's a Pacific grass that she adores. And the aquarium guy had to come filter the water, which involves pulling all of the water out of the tank for the most part. There's a little bit on the bottom to keep the fish alive and putting it back in once it's cleaned. Unfortunately, her favorite fish, whose name is Roscoe, got pulled out with the water. He somehow thought that would be a magical journey to go up the tank that was sucking all of the water out, which, actually would kill him if he kept swimming into it. Luckily, the aquarium guy, Sean, noticed what was happening and pumped the water back in. Fortunately, Roscoe survived. However, he started assuming the position that every fish goes into when they're about to die, belly up, his eyes are rolling back in his head, he's bleeding out of his chest. I immediately felt my heart sink to the ground and I didn't know what to do. I said, Sean, oh my gosh, we have to save him. How can we help this fish? And he's like, I don't know. There's only so much you can do. And he reached in the tank and kind of gave him a little fishy massage. And Roscoe still wasn't really coming around. I've been around my neighbor so much that I know the way she talks to her fish. And I said, Roscoe, come on, buddy. Come on, you can hang in there. Let's go, Roscoe. You're okay. Come on. And immediately I saw his entire mental shift go from accepting death and ready to give up to realizing he has so much to live for and coming back to reality. It was such a magical moment. Yes, Roscoe made it, Anthony. I was so relieved because I could not break that news to my neighbor that her favorite fish had died, but I couldn't imagine the impact and power that the words and touch had on this small little creature. He knew his name and he recognized that if he doesn't come around, he's never gonna get to see his mom again. It was just such a magical moment. I know it sounds very small, but I thought that the power of touch and words really are what we're needing so much in this life. 
And especially with COVID, having to force us to be social distanced, think about ways that you can connect with people still and share that oneness and touch their hearts without physically touching them, whether that's writing a letter or doing a video conference with someone. I know that I video chat my brother who's in Texas right now all the time to, just to see my nephew and his family because my nephew started talking and I would never know that unless I call and video chat with them. Think about all the people that you love and you want to feel connected and oneness with. Even strangers, if you're walking around, there's so many people with anxiety these days, just a simple smile or a wave at someone can really make their day and give them that life spirit that can keep their hopes and dreams alive and make them realize that this life is worth living even though sometimes it doesn't seem that way. The one important thing about oneness is to remember, you can't lose the power to connect with others and share oneness, but you can misuse the power, which is why it's so important for us to remember to go beyond ourselves and think about connectedness and togetherness and really the greater good that we all contribute to every single day. This is a quick story about my friend Aisha, who's also one of my mentees. I was on this team for Tech Runway. It's an incubator at my school. I just graduated from Florida Atlantic University. And she had never been out of the country, and we traveled to Toronto together. <laughs> Aisha is so adorable and very, <laughs> she's, she's got a lot to learn, but she's also very young, so she has a lot of experiences ahead of her. She booked her flight a little bit earlier home than I did and decided to take the train station all the way to the airport. I said, Aisha, that's great. Let me know when you get to the airport and when you land. I want to make sure that you're okay and you get there safely. I decided, because I had the night to myself and I was free, to go check out a Toronto Toastmasters club because I saw there was five right around this hotel where I was staying. I walk over to the hospital, get to the meeting, and I noticed that Aisha called me. I thought that was kind of strange. So I called her back right before the meeting started and she was in tears, ecstatic, freaking out, didn't know what to do. I said, Aisha, just please calm down. Tell me what's going on because the only way I can help you is if I know what's happening. She said, oh my gosh, Sam, I missed my flight. I didn't get here early enough. It's an international flight, so I have to be here an hour ahead of time and they're not gonna let me board. I said, Aisha, well, go talk to the gate agent, see if there's a way you can get put on the next flight. We still have the hotel room. Come back, take the train, take a taxi, an Uber, whatever you gotta do, just stay safe and let me know any updates if there's anything else I can do to help you. That connection and oneness, I could tell immediately dropped all of her fears and helped her feel like, okay, we're in this together. I'm not alone, even though this didn't work out exactly how I had planned, because whenever all the stakes are high, that seems to be when Murphy comes to visit us. <laughs> yes, I can share the slideshow later. If anyone else wants to have it, just please drop your emails into the chat and I'll make sure it gets over to you. But overall, the entire Toastmasters meeting, I was a little bit having anxiety myself, wondering, did my friend make it? Is she okay? Was she able to get her flight rebooked? Everything worked out in the end. She came back to the hotel. It was a big learning experience for her, but oh, <laughs> I'm so thankful that I was able to connect with her heart and help her understand that regardless of what happens, I was gonna make sure she's okay, she doesn't have to worry because we all feel alone at some times and we really need people in those moments to step up and tell us, hey, I've got your back. You don't have to worry because we're gonna stay afloat together. Another analogy for water is that in physics, water reaches its own level. It's always seeking the lowest level that it can reach, which is why we as leaders need to elevate the level that we reach people at. If they're down here, we need to bring them a little higher. Maybe not too high because 
that's unrealistic to have someone jump 10 levels in their mindset or their attitude at a given moment. But we as leaders can always help them see the silver lining and bring them a little higher than where we find them because we're really doing them a disservice if we bring them a little lower from our own experiences that are impacting our lives or if we just meet them where they're at because then we're not doing things to raise their vibration and their overall experience in life. Finally, on to the last point, wisdom wins. I know we've all learned this from our parents at some point in life, that wisdom is the key to living a happy and successful life. Whether that's a flexibility of how we handle situations or having an attitude of excellence. That's something we practice here in Toastmasters. Our four key values are respect, integrity, integrity <laughs> service, and excellence. If we're focused on serving others with that intent to give more than we take and always be of more service than we'd like to receive from others, we're gonna be operating from a place of wisdom. If we're constantly focused on respecting others and showing integrity in our choices and our words, then we'll also be reflecting this concept of wisdom, which really is about generating an experience that helps everybody win. If we focus on repenting, which real, the real definition of repent is really just a radical change of attitude. We're not perfect people. We all make mistakes. We have misperceptions. We make assumptions. It happens. It's inevitable to never do this. And as Brene Brown says, who's someone that I look up to very highly just for her perception of reality and her ideas, whenever we try to suppress the negative emotions, we also suppress and numb the positive emotions. We can't ignore if we're feeling bad, but we can communicate in a way that helps people understand and bring us up. If we say, hey, I'm feeling anxious or I'm feeling scared or I'm feeling overwhelmed, that's when we as leaders can either help them ourselves or connect with them with resources that can help them and overcome and thrive in those circumstances. Being fearless is not getting rid of fear, but it's operating in that state of fear and doing well in spite of being afraid. We're never gonna fully suppress that, but we can find ways to manage and overcome it and use it as fuel for our fires and impact the world even more. Most people want to use what's already created instead of using their power to create. Think about what gives you wisdom in your life. Is it reading spiritual text or is it being in nature and reflecting on the beauty of this world around us? Is your wisdom from your family members and people that you love? I know for me personally, my grandmother was someone that imparted the most wisdom and impact on my life. She was all about showing her love for people and making them feel valued and heard and seen. I feel like that is something that's underrated in our world these days. Actually, that secret of leadership that I hinted at earlier is actually love. If we can embody love, then we can mitigate that fear because we really have two options in life. It's fear or love, right? If we operate from a place of love, we're focused on what can we give to others? How can we be of service? How can I show respect? How can I make you feel like you matter? If we're more focused on fear, which is really ego-based, it's something we learn in yoga to leave at the door or take that hat off to say, Fear is more focused on ourselves. What do we need? What are we not getting? Who's judging me? Who thinks that I'm not enough? All of these fears, they're so universal. We all have them at times. Thank you, Lois. You are fantastic. I appreciate everything you do. <laughs> there is a recent Gallup poll that said there's four universal needs. This was actually 
distributed after COVID-19 and the four universal needs that they found that every follower or leader must serve is generating trust, compassion, stability, and most importantly, I think, is hope. We have to give people hope in the most turbulent storms because if we don't generate hope in the people that we serve, what kind of motivation do they have to reach their goals? If they feel like it's a hopeless situation, they're more likely to just throw in the towel and quit because we need to have that ability to see that things will get better. And the other three really help to generate that sense of hope and a brighter future ahead of us. If we have trust, which we can build through love, and we have compassion and stability, we have the credibility to show people that there is hope for a better future and that we should be working towards it together. One final poll, just to get a feel for the audience and how we're all feeling. Which of these four concepts will you be developing to thrive going forward? Is it the focus on intent, leverage your assets, oneness, optimistic oneness, I changed that last minute, <laughs> or oneness with all actually. I was having trouble deciding which it would be. Creativity has this issue of deciding sometimes. <laughs> Or the final option is wisdom wins. These are four really fantastic concepts. I encourage you to work on all four of them if you can, though it helps to really be intentional and focus on one at a time. Figure out which is the easiest I recommend and work on that first because it's nice to get little improvements. That way we stay empowered and feel like we can really achieve all four. If you want to be super optimistic and <laughs> really push yourself, you can work with the one that you feel is your biggest weakness and focus on that first so that you really get a sense of empowering yourself through adversity. Some people really enjoy that. I know I love when people tell me I can't do something because then I'm super motivated to show them that I can. I use that fuel and my fire because when people are trying to bring you down, I just reframe that as, okay, you're inspiring me to really be better because apparently you don't think I can do it, but I know for a fact that I can do it, especially with your encouragement. <laughs> yes, oneness is the key to everything. Lois, we're going to wrap up that poll just to see how much time we have for questions. I do want to get to most of them. Wow, I really love that the majority are going to be focused on oneness with all. That's, I think, key, especially to this world that we're living in right now. There's a lot of division, and unity is really our solution to bringing everything to a better place. All right, just to recap, if you want to take a screenshot, that would be awesome. Feel free to do it. I did not copyright this on the intention that I want to share it with everyone here. If you want to reshare it, feel free to do that. I'm going to be copywriting another <laughs> PowerPoint in the future. If you'd love to see that, I will keep you all posted on it. But the main four keys to fluid leadership and riding any wave that comes your way, whether it's a tidal wave or <laughs> a choppy surf wave, focus on your intent. Be very clear about your goals and the direction that you wanna go and where you wanna take your team. Use your assets by leveraging them and maxing out all of your advantages that you have in life, whether they're your personal assets or assets of your team. Use every strength that you have because you're going to need them all. We're not given any gifts that we weren't meant to give back in this world. And if we hold on to them, we're doing a disservice to ourselves as well as everyone around us. Optimistic oneness. Stay positive. It is the biggest success secret. I know we've heard this a million times. If you stay focused on optimism, you can achieve anything. And together, we can achieve more. Finally, wisdom wins. Do whatever you can to build your wisdom, whether it's looking at 
an orchid, as someone mentioned earlier, there are orchids in their garden. You can learn so much wisdom from nature and from animals and from everyone around you. Just look for those little moments and see the insights that they hold. Read as much as you can, learn from other leaders, teach people because the ultimate way to memorize knowledge is to share it with someone else. With all that being said, I will take any questions. I'll go through the chat if we have time for it, but just feel free to raise your hand and I will have Lois who is also an amazing speaker. If you didn't hear her yesterday, she's phenomenal. I'm sure her command with your presence virtually will be out there somewhere floating around the internet. <laughs> uh, thank you. Actually, you do have a few questions, Sam. The okay. first one is from Paul Finkelstein. He asked, it's important for you to adjust your leadership style for the audience, but do you agree with lead, follow, or get out of the way? That's a great question, Paul. I really do think that there is some truth to that idea of lead, follow, or get out of the way, which I think is reflected by fluid leadership. If you think about leveraging your assets, sometimes you have an asset that fits the situation where you should be leading. That is your time to shine. If you're really great with delegating or leading teams, then leverage that asset and be a leader in that situation. Sometimes I think it's better to be a follower. If say someone on your team has a better asset or a stronger asset than yours, then why not leverage that? If someone's amazing at technology and virtual conferencing, such as Lois or Darren or so many other leaders that we've seen, take advantage of those resources that you have because why would you want to lead if there's someone else that would be a better leader in that situation? Which also kind of falls into the get out of the way <laughs> mindset is sometimes as leaders, we get caught up in the idea of being a leader and always being at the forefront of whatever project or mission we're on. It's really important to sometimes get out of the way and let your team lead. Let them take over and really use everything that you've given them already by your leadership effect or any type of tools and strategies that you've given them. Sometimes we're too involved as leaders and we like to micromanage. That often I've seen is very destructive to people feeling valued and feeling appreciated as well as developing their own leadership styles and effectiveness if we don't get out of the way and let them be leaders then they don't have that opportunity to develop themselves does that answer your question paul i hope so if not feel free to email me <laughs> well you are getting tons of kudos everybody absolutely loves what you're coming up with and one thing that jessica demig said was under promise and over deliver do you agree with that statement I agree that it is a logical way to go about keeping satisfaction in a certain sense. If you under promise and over deliver, then you're definitely going to keep people satisfied. However, I don't really like to under promise. I like to keep promises honest and transparent. That way people feel like they can trust me. If I tell someone I'm going to get back to you with, this form or this email, I like to give them a realistic idea of when it's going to happen. If I just say, I'll get to it in the next week or so, which maybe in a way, under promising is good. However, I do like to promise in a way that they feel you're actually going to give them some kind of benefit and value. If you under promise too much, they might think you're just never going to do it always, always, always go above and beyond expectations and over deliver because you can never really over deliver with people. They're always wanting more and you're definitely going to keep them as a repeat customer or just a really great friend or loved one. Do you have time for one more, Lois? I do see that red signal. Yes, you have five minutes. So they're still coming in. First of all, everybody loved your fish analogy. 
I mean, oh. that just, you're going to go back through this and just kind of smile with all the, I love your fish story. Fish have feelings too. It was really <laughs> cute. And Roscoe, they're all remembering Roscoe. So you touched a lot of hearts with the fish story. And I think your vocal variety was part of what made that so strong. But we do have a comment from Cameron who said, uh, who asked the question, assets in what sense? So this was early in your presentation, about 920. So we might have to get Cameron to unmute himself. And I'm going to go ahead and find him right now. Let's see. Okay, so I've unmuted you. If you can go ahead and explain what your question meant, assets in what sense, character traits. Sure, are you able to hear me? We are. Yes, Cameron. All right, cool. No, you're, you're talking about this sense of leveraging your assets or writing down a list of what assets you have in terms, of, because I remember in that part, one thing in particular you said in that part of leveraging ass, assets was maxing out the advantages that you have in, in your life and such. Uh -huh. the, and then you said to write down that list of assets that you have, but I was, ta I was thinking, I was wondering in the assets in what sense? So do you mean in terms of character traits or materialistic standpoint? Like what did you mean in the what did you mean by assets in that standpoint? Great question, Cameron. I actually meant to clarify more on that, but I wanted to get through the whole presentation. So I kind of skipped through a little bit. Assets can be both personality traits as well as resources. If say you have a car and you know someone that doesn't have a car. You can always say, hey, do you want to carpool to this Toastmasters meeting? Or would it help if I pick up groceries for you while I'm out at Publix? I really just think that assets in general are ways that we can give back and provide value to people, whether that is your ability to develop relationships or your ability to speak your truth. A lot of people struggle with that. And I think it's really important as leaders to be transparent and lead by example which is why it's very personal to you. I can't tell you exactly what your assets would be. Maybe it's your ambition. You're constantly looking for more opportunities and ways to serve others. Maybe it's your ability to be agile and switch between different ideas really seamlessly and with grace. It could be your ability to stay positive in difficult situations. A lot of people aren't able to do that. Think about the things that you really excel in or another way to think of assets is your strengths. What are you really strong at as a leader? Are you able to be, uh, are you, do you have a huge work ethic? Do you work harder than anybody else that you know? Uh, does that answer your question, Cameron? I think you're muted. You can give me a thumbs up or something. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll give that. Oops. My connection is pretty, oh, shoot. Okay, my no connection worries. was, it's pretty slow, that's why, but the, so essentially, it, that's, that's what I was just confused by in terms of when you said assets was, so basically in term, assets in terms of you, your leadership style, character traits, and the strengths overall that you have within you. Exactly, any strength that you have, it could okay. be material, it could be emotional, it could be mental. It could even just be your knowledge, things that you bring to the table that you know about that other people don't. Sam, I'm okay. going to try and get one more in here. We've, we've got a bunch okay. more, but I, this one. If your major leadership style is oneness, what do you suggest to a leader who cannot seem to get someone on the team to share the same goals, especially if that person is an introvert who is not willing to be upfront about the issue? Wow, that is a quite complex question. Okay, oneness is more of a concept than a style. Let's just get that clear because leadership styles are more like democratic or charismatic. Oneness is really about connecting with people's hearts. Think about if they're an introvert, they're very quiet, most likely they like to be reserved. It's better to approach an introvert in their own style. You definitely want to meet them in a way where you can pull them aside privately as Cameron just actually commented. I love that idea. I was just thinking the same thing. 
the synchronicity is great. <laughs> really be sensitive to their own needs. The thing about fluid leadership is finding ways to use different leadership styles to meet the needs and serve your people during times of change. We're constantly going through change in life. How can you leverage aspects of different leadership styles to combat those changes and help people thrive within them? I think with introverts, the biggest hurdle to overcome is helping them feel belonging and connection to other people. Maybe when you have that private conversation with that individual, try to figure out what is making them feel like they don't belong or that they don't feel that sense of oneness with everyone. If you get the impression that they're not connecting and having that oneness, ask questions, be open to conversation, and approach in a way where you're suggesting things instead of telling them what to do. Also open up the conversation by asking them if they're open to suggestions in the first place. Sometimes people like to word vomit on us and tell us you should do this, you should do that. It's really important to have that sense of compassion and really know that people are doing the best that they can, whether or not we want to believe that or it seems that way. Figure out ways that you can help make them stronger and help them reach their goals. Figure out what are your goals for being in this organization? How can I make you feel like you're more part of our family? Because that's really what we're looking to do. Thank you so much, Lois. I see that. <laughs> Ohm <Thank> sign. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been fabulous. Let's give her some love and tell her how awesome she is. If you are not on screen, you can still give reactions and clap and thumbs up and tell her she's amazing because that's what everything in your chat is saying. I have emailed you all the email addresses that I've captured. So you have that in one document that you can easily go through to send them the presentation. I have pasted the link in here so that Samantha can get our evaluation. We do have eight minutes to our next presentation which is inclusive language in speaking. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous.